Now, right. now you're talking. You Big Daddy's right on the money there. Big you know? Daddy in the Top 40 yeah. Timeline. Top 40 Timeline video show brought to you this week by National UK, UK Radio and uh, all the gang there, including Nigel Crane, and uh, who runs everything. He's and, a busy uh, guy, eh? Nigel's Nigel very busy. Nigel's just constantly. Yeah, yeah. He reminds me, he's a British version of me. He does everything. Or even Austin. You know, because... Austin Douglas. I do newscasts every day. I do weather every day across Canada. Uh, I, I do sports feeling. every day. You do the same thing with the rock and roll. Um, I'm so... T and behind the scenes, too. And behind the scenes. <laughs> and, uh, but it's... behind it's, the scenes, though. You know, I, I, and when I do my sports casts on the, on the, on the networks I'm on, uh, the air radio network, I, I watch every highlight and I study what's going on. I love it. I suck it up yeah. in my old age, you know. Perfect. And Nigel Crane, same way in the UK. And hello to uh, Kenny Tosh and all the great folks, uh, Emperor Roscoe, and all the wonderful shows that run on that radio station, UK National Radio. All right, we're gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna introduce you to Lee Lakin and Leo Lywood, who puts together. The top forty time you know, video both, show. You know we both have LLA. Eh? Yeah, I know. I know. LLA. L -L -L -L. <laughs> yeah. And we got yeah. Mel with Mel Mar, MM. Yeah. Yep. It's there almost like watching a Marvel movie or That's something. That's right. You know, like <laughs> Peter and, Parker. Uh, we'll start. We'll all uh, get shirts you know. with her initials. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, Peter the piano player with the polyester. Top poly forty LL. Yep. LL. <laughs> Peter the piano player with a polyester tie, of yeah. course, who is a big yeah. part of my show. Um, yeah. He plays oh. all the different. Uh, versions of uh, on piano when I'm reading stories from off the wire you know on the show he'll be there totally naked uh, just like Monty Python there you know oh, with the guy that image, man. Uh, I know I know, and just so you know uh, but he does wear a polyester tie that's why he's Peter <laughs> the piano player with the Hopefully polyester it's cold tie in the room. Yes, it is. It's just always you know, cold. We have a lot of paragraph ones, a little more than usual. So just a heads up. It's it's she's busy week. She's in telling music us music trivia, courtesy of Leo Iwood. Why don't we let her big start? Page all the time, and uh, we have a ton this week of really cool trivia and stuff. I'm telling you guys, I don't care how long you've been in the business. There's going to be stuff you haven't heard. Actually, of. I even got Mike Mark Panopoulos. I don't know if you saw that the other day with the little Richard post. That, oh, you guys don't usually look at it. I even got Mark. Mark was like, "Wow." I didn't even know that. I knew oh, this, but I didn't know that. You and guys. I went, wow, Mark, now I feel privileged See, because I even caught I, you. I purposely <laughs> Thank you. You know what? Because you're talking about Little Richard, aren't you? Yes. The, there the was a post that, that we're going to uh, read it. We're yeah, going to read it. Read so it you'll yeah. see. It, but I, we try not to read it because we love doing this show so no, much. No, I don't. We don't yeah. read this because I want Surprise. my own. Uh, I, I want that reaction. Yeah. So I Me don't. Me too. Right. That's why we stumble all the time. And, I have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, kick it so off. So here we go. So in 1990 or 1984, Simon Cowell dressed as a wonder dog on on various UK TV shows to promote Rough Mix, a techno tune featuring dogs barking. Okay, you know what that makes me think of? Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah. Robin oh, yeah. Williams dressed up as uh, a dog uh, on the show, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Remember that? I don't I'm know. showing my age. It makes me think of the singing dogs. Ruff, 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 oh, ruff, my ruff, God. Was that more Christmas ruff, stuff ruff, or ruff, ruff. whatever? My yeah, boss actually made me play that stuff on FM 108 at Christmas time. Norman B. I oh said, you, you got to be kidding me, Norm. You want me to pl actually play that? <laughs> and, but it was a great gimmick on that. And he was right. People listen to People it. People listen to it. So I'll do one more. Before he got involved with Courtney Love, late Nirvana, main man Kurt Cobain was in a relationship with bikini kill drummer Toby Vale, who had subsequently broken up with him. Anyhow, Toby used to wear a deodorant called Teen Spirit. The band singer Kathleen Hanna used to talk about Kurt having Toby scent on her, which resulted in a peculiar graffiti in Cobain's room one day. As Hanna herself explained, she ended up in Cobain's apartment one night and smashed a bunch of shit. I took out a Sharpie marker and I wrote all over his bedroom wall and it was a rental. So it was really kind of lame that I did that, she said. I passed out with the marker in my hand and woke up hungover. Six months later, Kurt phoned Kathleen to ask her if he could use some of her wall scribbles as song lyrics. 
I thought, how is he going to use Kurt Smells Like Teen Spirit as a lyric, she added. <laughs> and it was the mo one of the most, probably the most popular song of the 90s. Oh, it was, it, it, it was and a, for it, them, it was a huge hit. <coughs> Massive hit for them. It really kind of put them on the map, so to speak. But I didn't know radio. that. That was but something uh, I learned. No, I just love uh, Nirvana stuff. No, but the, how Teen Spirit came to be with all that. Yeah. I, I didn't know all that, so it was oh, kind of cool. cool. Uh, 1968, the Beatles record, Most of Glass Onion, John Lennon's song about fans who suss out hidden messages in, suss out. Suss out <laughs> in his uh, <laughs> hidden messages in his lyrics. And that went on for decades. Like, it, they still, oh, people, something. there was always something, right? You know, Paul, well, Paul's, Paul's dead. dead. Backwards. Uh, you mean play Revolution you know, 90, number Paul nine, dead walrus, backwards. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was always those, uh, those uh, kind of. Uh, conspiracy theories almost going on with the Beatles for years even I would still think some of it goes on even I still believe some of it I don't know uh, all right jump to the next one 1971 the Jackson 5 cartoon series Remember that? Oh my called God. the Jackson 5 <laughs> debuts on ABC each episode shows various adventures with animated versions of the group along with Michael's pet mice Ray and Charles <laughs> and his snake, Rosie. The cartoon runs from 1971 to 1973. Why do you think? That. Why do you think he named his uh, mice Ray and Charles? Come on. <laughs> no idea. Ray Charles, of course. <laughs> I have no idea. You go with uh, David Bowie too. Go All right, 1977. David Bowie joins uh, 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 Bing Crosby to record the crooner's merry old Christmas special. Bowie refuses to sing Little Drummer Boy with Crosby, so his part is rewritten as Peace on Earth. He does the over harmony, right? Crosby dies a month later before the show airs, and the day the duet becomes a Christmas classic, growing even more popular when MTV starts playing the clips a few years later. And it did. It became crazy pop. I think people still watch it today as well. Why did he not want to sing Little Drummer Boy? Was it something to do with his religion or something? Or? Mm -hmm. but I, I hadn't heard that one. Let's find that out for next week. Wow. Yeah, there's Remind another me, one. Though, or I'll forget. Hey, she's got a million <laughs> things to Google already. I might look it up later. 2001 this week, on the afternoon of the terrorist attacks against the country, a group of U.S. senators and congressmen gather on the Capitol steps to sing Irving Berlin's God Bless America. The song is invoked many times in the following days. And in 2001, as Gerard Way watches in horror from the Manhattan Ferry as the World Trade Center's Twin Towers collapse, he realizes life is too short to not follow his dream. Shortly after, he starts his own band and My Chemical Romance is born. Wow, that's a neat story. 2001, The Strokes debut album, uh, this is it drops on vinyl in the U.S. It contains uh, the song "The New York City Cops," an anthem against police brutality. The defiant track is removed from the forthcoming CD release in light of the terrorist attacks and the valiant response of the NYPD. And they did a great job. Uh, a, a New York crazy, Fire Department and Police Department. Crazy week. Like, that, um, you know, everybody says you know you knew where you were. Yeah. Exactly. You knew exactly where you were when that happened, and um, oh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see what it inspired you know musicians to. Well, even the post I put up um, today had a heck of a time with it, but figured out how to get it up because the meta ban on uh, Canadian news, even though it's really not news and it's from 2001, but it would not let me post it. Anyways, I figured it out, but I mean the um, CCC which is a, a kind of a, a corporation. I don't know if it's like the CRTC here um, in the States oversaw stuff. Long story short, they literally looked at 162 songs to be banned. Now, it was said in the end they thought it was a hoax, but nonetheless, to look at these songs, Stairway to Heaven, like the, the Neil Young songs, there was all kinds of... How can like you going, ban what? Stairway because they, to Heaven? Because they were looking at it as it may not be good for people that lost all these people and they were suffering and they were saying that we would be insensitive. Uh, so anyways, rap. 
Fool. Yeah, exactly, 100%. So Fool. anyways, but it, in the end, it was said it was a hoax, so I don't know the truth on that. If anybody knows, let us know. Jesus Absolutely. Christ. How All can right, you? Man. Yeah. Mr. Jack Johnson. Senior songwriter Jack Johnson was a professional surfer until he had an accident. He broke his wrist, had his front teeth knocked out, and received more than 150 stitches to his mouth and forehead. One of his most popular songs is Upside Down, and I love that. That's a Curious George movie. I absolutely love that. Movie. It is right. Upside it Down is, is the I theme know. song for, I know, you're and right. I love it. I love it. My kids love Curious George. So did Brody. Oh, yeah. and, and I love the song, so. In any event, Bono from U2 was quoted, Justin Hawks, Hawkins is a funny guy. I presume he's not being serious. Hmm. One more, 1966, The Roger Miller Show, starring the country singer, debuts on NBC. 1966. Mm-hmm. Roger Miller was a great host of, of, a, of a TV show, I remember. Well, he, he, he actually kind of changed it because, it, again, like we do a loosey-goosey kind of atmosphere here. He had the he, same kind of thing. He took, yeah, he took that f- formal thing away and, and just yeah, it made it. country. Yeah, you know, exactly. Country, yeah. All right, 1966, the Monkees TV show makes its debut. With four actors chosen to, pray, to portray a pop band based, you know, basically on the Beatles. While the Monkees are a fictional band, they become very real and eventually play their own recordings instead of studio musicians. And there was actually a musician who commented on this one on the page. And it said, oh, no, never compare the Beatles to no. the Monkees. Oh. And we, we had a little conversation, but he wasn't meaning it They could have even said loosely based on the Beatles. Well, I think, no, but I think what they were trying to do is they were trying to create a pop band when they did oh, this yeah. that was very much like the Beatles. And instead, the Monkees took on a life of their own, yeah. right? Well, the Monkees were very successful. Of course and I, I, I love them. There's their hits. Uh, the crazy one song of, by the Monkees I don't like. The Last crazy train 17 to Clarksville. To yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody has their own time and their own, it's you know. Own, and yeah, uh, exactly. I think the Monkees songs stand up to the Beatles songs, but the Beatles songs were, were you know, they were, they were much more musicians than the Monkees were. Well, I think know, they were musicians. A, a broader range of an audience yeah. than the Monkees. Absolutely so. huge. <laughs> you know, about it. 1979, the ABC News program 2020 runs a special, the Elvis cover up which alleges that Elvis Presley's death was linked to prescription drugs. When his doctor, George Nicopopoulos, is brought to trial, evidence shows that Elvis had prescriptions for about 10,000 doses of drugs (laughs) just in the year before he died in 1977. He went downhill from like 74... Just to about 77. Quick. And, uh, Once him and Priscilla separated, yeah. he really much. started to go from Well, that. people don't realize he ate a lot. Oh, God, yeah. Elvis, Elvis had five banana splits for breakfast. I'm serious. I, I, unless it's... it's uh, uh, I've seen it three or four different places that he, he was a big eater. He, yeah. loved, oh, he, he, loved food, eater yeah. uh, he loved food that was bad for him, like we all do. That uh, he did eat a lot. I mean, five. Can you imagine eating five bananas? And the stress of living. I couldn't get through one right now. And the stress of living the life he lived. Yeah. Can't imagine that. Well, no. And he had to go to a show. If he wanted to go watch a movie, he had to rent the whole theater just so he could go in peace. So I mean, yeah. Yeah. What happened in 1985? Good daddy. The Rolling Stones published their interview with Prince, who has, uh, well, Rolling Stone, not the Rolling Stones, uh, the magazine. Uh, published their interview with Prince, who has not spoken to the press in three years. He remains elusive, but explains why he has made up stories in his early years to appease and confound reporters. I used to tease a lot of journalists early on because I wanted them to concentrate on the music. Which and is, that's um, exactly what he... It was all about the music, he, and that's who he, he was. He was not a stupid guy. He no. was a uh, very, very, very smart man. You know, it's... Uh, This week in 2011, suffering from Alzheimer's disease, Glenn Campbell performs its Your Amazing Grace on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Campbell's memory is shot, but on uh, stage he's able to perform. And uh, reading the lyrics from a teleprompter, he had just started his goodbye tour, which continued for more than a year until his condition deteriorated to the point where he could no longer perform. And uh, I have to say... um, um, a guy I work with and, and respects, uh, Rock and Robin, 
is now living in a home. He has Alzheimer's. Wow. So there's something that, uh, and we love Robin. Right we Absolutely. love Robin. Yeah, um, my uncle worked with Robin for years. Um, and, but uh, uh, one of my one of my mentors, and uh, I, I only just found out that he was in, in a home in, in um, a rest home in, in when Burlington. You, when you talk about that story, it just makes me think even more, Big Daddy, that you know when people are in that kind of mental state and whatnot, that they, they play music and. It all goes away for that moment in time. For well, them. it brings them back to that age. Yeah. Well, we're gonna try and we're gonna try and get them for the reunion. Them. I can't promise, but uh, I, if I have uh, to go down there and get them myself, I'll go down and get them. No, not not worried about it. Just rest yourself there, rock and roll, because okay. uh, we love you. Absolutely. All right, you want me doing the one more here? Yeah. The title track of Tool's 2006 effort, 10,000 Days," is reportedly dedicated to singer Maynard James Keenan's mother, Judith Marie who had suffered a stroke in 1976, leaving her paralyzed for 27 years before she died. 27 years is approximately 10,000 days, while the song's first part, Wings for Mary, comes as another indicator of lyrics inspiration. In the early 70s, Elvis' manager, Colonel, Com Colonel Tom Parker, charged journalists. $125,000 for an hour of time with Elvis. And you wonder why there was so much controversy over Colonel yeah. Parker. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, and that's why I say the life he led. Jesus. Was, uh, you can't, you can't imagine that. You can't. It's, uh, you know, uh, you look at guys like Justin Bieber, same thing. That intensity of, of just barrage of paparazzi and everybody's in your life and in your face. No way. Ringo Starr finally had it. Oh, you God, know, and yeah. Ringo's a nice guy, but... You know, to be a Beatle must must have been just pure hell. Well, hard on all four of them. You can, you can only imagine what they go through. Yeah. Well, we 19 live in Canada, I'm eating Timbits, everybody's saying that. <laughs> 1925, jazz singer Mel Torme, a.k.a. The Velvet Fog, is born in Chicago, Illinois. He would begin his professional career at age four, oh. singing You're Driving Me Crazy with the Coon Sanders Original Nighthawk Orchestra. And that's not the fine young cannibals either. That's no, 1925. No, no, no. 1960, <laughs> a movement to ban Ray Peterson's new single, Tell Laura I Love Her, begins in the UK when it's feared that the song's powerful story of a stark car driver who dies young while racing for his young girl's love will inspire a death cult amongst amongst teens. The BBC were, uh, yes, you know, they do. Yeah, I, did I, they think of? Uh, they, you know, the, the old <laughs> they monster put that mash in their comes minds. to mind <laughs> when they banned monster mash in England. That's absolutely ridiculous. Oh, well, and well, they had bands. some strange. The BBC had some strange, strange ideas. No Still doubt do about it. Yes. All right, 1963. Graham Nash of the Hollies falls out of their touring van after a Scottish gig, <laughs> leaning on an unlocked door and tumbling out at 40 miles an hour. 36 years later to the day, he breaks both legs in a boat accident off the coast of Hawaii. Poor old Graham, eh? Can you imagine? I, yeah, no. <laughs> leaning on the door, man. I could just see him. Just lean. Oh! Oh, well, there goes Graham. Where'd he go? Oh, sorry. I'll we'll have to back up. We've lost Graham. Yeah. He's fell out. 1965, the Beatles release yesterday in the U.S. and an acoustic Paul McCartney composition with a melody that appeared to him in a dream. It becomes their 10th number one hit. He woke up and stumbled to the piano at his bedside and he worked out the chords. I just literally fell out of bed, found out what key I had dreamed it in, and I played it. And so one of the greatest songs ever simply came to its composer in a dream. Guidance uh. if I ever heard it. You might as well have the Alice Cooper one, too. All right. I remember that. 1991, Alice Cooper plays yeah. Freddy Krueger's father in the movie Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. I did not know that. His father's a, a priest, isn't he? Or, or a, a, like a reverend that. or something. But uh, imagine having Alice Cooper as your son. and mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> now, But Alice is a very religious guy. Very much so now, even more so now. Oh, yeah, he was always... He, yeah. he said, you know, that wasn't me up there. That no, was no. Alice Cooper. That's Alice Cooper. That's Alice Cooper is as regular a guy as you can find, you know. And uh, you want me to take the... It's okay. Right it's all yours, man. 2000, Almost Famous is released in theaters across the U.S. The film is a semi-autobiographical account of writer and director Cameron Crowe's 
time spent interviewing rock bands for Rolling Stone in the 70s when he was just a teenager. The film centers around a fictional band called Stillwater, and rather than being based on one band in particular, Stillwater feels like every 70s arena band rolled into one. Patrick Fugit plays the young journalist accompanying Stillwater on tour, straddling the line between careful observer and active participant in rock and roll uh, decadence. Yes. While the uh, story is fictionalized, many of the main players from that era are portrayed, including iconic rock journalist Lester Bangs and young Penny Lane, who kept quiet a uh, few mus musicians warm at night on the road in the film. Crow changes the spelling of uh, her first name to Penny. Almost Famous offers a first-person glimpse into behind-the-scenes reality of life in the music world once the flower power movement of the 60s has faded out to make way for more fist-in-the-air, blow-out-the-amp stadium sound. And it was a stadium sound. Yeah. You know, it was crazy, uh, the, the difference it went to. You know. Did you want me to do uh, this one, too? Yeah. When the legendary Beatles sang about riding in their 1965 classic Ticket to Ride, they certainly weren't talking about <laughs> trains. According to John Lennon, the ticket mentioned in the tune refers to health cards carried by Hamburg prostitutes, indicating clean health and absence of sexually transmissive diseases. So if your girl happens to be going away with you and you miss her dearly, Ticket to Ride isn't the song you're looking for. And I, oh. I didn't know that one. <laughs> yeah, I, you got me on that one there. I had no idea That's about funny. that. You know, they were they were so good, weren't they? They were putting stuff down on paper. Oh, that, uh, McCartney and Lennon, they were always writing down. Just like Amanda's always on her phone. They're always writing down no, stuff. No, I think she's got them beat. No, she does. <laughs> <laughs> the Simpsons UK number one hit, Do the Bartman, Bart was co written by Michael Jackson. It was long rumored that Michael uh. Jackson co wrote the song with, song with music producer Brian Lauren. Lauren has subsequently denied that, claiming that he wrote 100% of the song. But Jackson did come up with the title, sang backing vi vocals, and requested that he make a cameo in the lyrics Eat Your Heart Out, Michael. The Simpsons had became the first cartoon characters to score a number one since the Archies hit Sugar Sugar in 1969. What year was the Simpsons again? 91, did you say? Or does it say? Was it, no, it, uh, say. That's that's, it was early 90s because I remember coming on the radio and going, my yeah, God. It was because that's when yeah. Bart, that's uh, Bart and everything was yeah. taken oh God, off. Yeah. Don't have a cow, man. So, nine, I'll do one more. So, we got uh, 1955. Little Richard entered a New Orleans recording studio to begin two days of recording. Things were not going well, and during a break, Richard and his producer, Bumps Blackwell, went to the Dew Drop Inn for lunch. Richard started playing the piano in the bar like crazy, singing a loud and lewd version of Tutti Frutti. With only 15 minutes left in the session, Richard recorded the song and coined the phrase, A wop bop a loo wop, bop bam bam. <laughs> it's a wop bop a loo bop, bop a lop bop, bam boom. boom. And he I used, to do it from memory. What do you know where he got that <laughs> saying from? He was a kitchen cook, and he used to sing it when he was cooking. And yeah. this is the one that I said that Mark, and that's what that's what that's Mark right. said. That's Rather what said. than him swearing, yep. this is what he would say. Yeah. But Mark said, as he said, he had no idea what came before that. Yeah. yeah. So I was kind. That was kind of cool. Uh, 1968, Jim Morrison collapses during Jefferson Airplane set at a concert in Amsterdam, forcing the Doors, who were sharing the bill, to go on as a trio. Wow. That must have been just entertaining as hell. What a great twosome, Jefferson Airplane and the Doors together. Oh and there's a photo of Jim curled up on the floor uh, with the mic in his hand. Oh, God. <laughs> 1969, before taking the stage with Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, at the Big Sur Festival in California, Stephen Still gets in a sloppy fist fight with a heckler railing them for their uh, prolific lifestyle. The festival is raising funds for Joan Baez Institute for the Study of no Nonviolence. And there's videos, it, it, I don't know how they got it, but there is video of this happening. And this yeah. guy that's on stage, and they're just going back and forth, shoving yeah. each other. It was. There's a great video on YouTube, you've probably seen it, of the drummer <laughs> in this band. This is a no-man band, and just a regular band. And 
the singer gets mad at the drummer, and then the oh, drummer yeah, hits him. Yeah. Oh, God, the yeah. singer, and down he goes. No, but the singer, little fellow, yeah. like, just gets up and he's back <laughs> at it again. Oh, yeah. You gotta love rock and roll. Don't folks. mess with us, little people. Yeah. <laughs> Go All ahead right, with the Maryland. Dad, no, Big Daddy is. All right, nineteen ninety-eight. Marilyn Manson released their third <laughs> album, <laughs> Mechanical Animals. <coughs> Pardon me. Target, Walmart. And some retailers refuse to stock it because of the cover, which depicts the group's frontman in naked female form. Oh. The album follows a concept with Manson portraying an alien called Omega and an earthling named Alpha. Omega becomes a rock star but is swallowed up by the lifestyle. The band is good for business, generating welcome controversy and helping it go to number oh, one in oh, America. Absolutely. That and was a creepy pit. That, that album cover, though? With Manson, with little female breasts, and I don't know. I, 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 I don't it like... It me out because that I, face... You, <laughs> you know what? I mean, I, I, I love music and, and musicians, but he gives me the creeps, Marilyn Manson. But it sold a ton <laughs> yeah, but that was it even sold creepier. a shit ton uh, of albums for the guy. So uh, it's, okay. you kind of look at it as, was it a publicity stunt mm -hmm. just to sell albums or, you know? This gives me the creeps. He was why. originally, I think, a writer, right? Yeah. He mm -hmm. was he was an author and a writer, yeah. Yeah. but or wanted to be anyway. I don't. Well, he, did, he, actually, he did do it. He there's photos of yeah. him actually doing journalism. But oh. anyways, 2008 Iron Maiden singer Bruce Dickinson was one of the pilots who flew specially chartered flights after 85,000 tourists were stranded in the U.S., the Caribbean, Africa, and Europe after Britain's third largest tour operator went into administration. The singer who had worked for the airline, Astraeus, for nine years, took up flying during a low point in his solo career after he quit the band in 1993. And here's another tidbit to do with, <laughs> with him. He was also asked, I believe, to fly the band on tour. Oh, he really? did? And he Any refused. Time. No, he refused. He out and out refused. Oh. He said, no. No. He had no interest whatsoever. There was an article about it, and I looked at it. Well, you know, he's got to concentrate on the next gig. Never well, mind. Uh, I wouldn't uh, want to work and then go uh, work. Yeah, uh, work and work and work and work. Yeah, I yeah, see. But I don't think he, was, he still, was he still with the band though? Uh, then I don't think he was. Oh, I'm okay. not sure. Anyways, I, I don't know. I don't know that much about our name as much as I do the '60s, '70s stuff. So what's going on with no. Leonard Cohen? No, 2018. Oh, Leonard's, sorry. Leonard's next. Yeah. 2018, Verve Records Leonard's in the a, wings, folks. Had a, held a lunch party at the Rainbow Room in New York City to celebrate the release of Tony Bennett and Diana Krall, their album Love Is Here To Stay. After the duo performed their rendition of Fascinating Rhythm, Guinness World, uh, World Records adjudicator Alex Angert um, announced Bennett, who first recorded the tune under the stage name Joe Barry, over 68 years earlier, was now the title holder for the longest time between the release of an original recording and a re-recording wow. of the same single. Wow. That's unreal. That's cool. That and I'm cool. Gonna, this one I'm going to read because I love this one. Yeah, it works. Leonard Cohen's 1974 track, Chelsea Hotel, number two, plays tribute to the musician's romantic encounter with the late, great Janis Joplin at New York City's Hotel Chelsea Brothel. I, uh, the well. lyrics, the lyrics, giving me head on the unmade bed, while the limousines wait in the street, and I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. You were famous. Your heart was a legend. Suggest ever so blatantly, just exactly went on. Oh, really? Cohen even gets a bit harsh at the end with such lines as, "I don't mean to suggest that I love you the best. I can't keep track of each fallen robin. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. That's all." I don't even think of you all that often. Wow. Mm -hmm. But that is definitely a Cohen book. Oh, <laughs> definitely. That is him. Yeah, that, like, that's a quote for sure. But I, I never knew anything about that. I, I That was kind of cool. <laughs> I didn't know him no. and Janice uh, had a bit of a there rendezvous. Well, and there's pictures of them out front of the Chelsea Hotel. There you go. So. There you go. It's got to be real. Ah, yeah. the most desperately aged duo to score a UK hit is Andy Williams, born uh, back in 1928, and actress Denise Van Outen, born in 1974. Separated by an age gap of 45 years, one month and 11 days, the biggest of any duo, duo. they had a 2002 number 23 hit, 
I can't take my eyes off of you. Hey, you sound like Frankie Valley just a little bit there. Did you notice that? Such so is the tones of his voice yeah. there. Sounded like you're from New York or something. Should I chime in like, hey, like Van Houten? Should hey, I do it like Van Houten? We'll do it together? Yes. <laughs> and New York is, you know, it's a whole different, yeah, there's some coffee down the corner. Yeah, store. coffee. Sorry I spilled coffee over there. Yeah. But uh, I All love right, Big Daddy, 1963. 1963, Pete Seeger, who had been blacklisted from network TV after being found in contempt of the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1955, agrees to appear on the ABC variety show Hoot Nanny, but refuses when the network asks him to sign a loyalty oath. Poor old Pete Seeger. That's it's unreal, man. Again, the censorship Times bullshit that goes it's on. It's crap. It's absolutely rubbish. 1969, Genesis take the stage for the first time, playing at the cottage owned by leader Peter Gabriel's former Sunday school teacher. <laughs> there, there you go. There's the gig. All 1969. Boy, and they were known as a... Phil they, wasn't even with them yet because he didn't join them until, mm -hmm. I think, 1970, wasn't it? Well, well Trick of the Tail was more 1970, of an album rock right? sound yeah. to it than a, a commercial. They became commercial, but when they first started, they were very much of an FM band. You know, you didn't hear them on AM radio in the 70s. Oh, it was that. You heard them on FM it was radio. That, but they, were, they were such a different sound mm -hmm. and tone, you know, like yeah. Yes, when Yes came out. It was all that kind of different. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was a, it was a whole different uh, style of music. You know, it was Genesis. So. They didn't hit the AM radio airwaves till the '77 no. when, uh, uh, and in uh, 1982. Oh, Grace, I was gonna say I'll take one and he takes one. Cause it's the last two. Oh, it's the last two. Then you guys go it's ahead. It's the last two. Go ahead, you. 1982. Have. Grace Kelly, Princess of Monaco, dies the day after suffering a stroke at the wheel and driving her car off a cliff. Hmm. The 52-year-old female actress or former actress garnered acclaim in the 1956 musical comedy High Society alongside Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra. She was also one of the many stars name-checked in Madonna's Vogue. Yeah. Wow. And peace out to everybody in Monaco when that earthquake. And that's just oh, yeah, right now, definitely. Yeah, crazy, good, good, crazy, crazy. definitely. Yeah, uh, Morocco got nailed. MTV debuts Total Request Live, a countdown of the top 10 fan requested music videos hosted by Carson Daly. And by the end of its 10 year run, the show is a cultural phenomenon. Yeah. MTV, very busy, busy place. Made yeah, a lot of people that popular. We're just about done, I think, I aren't think we? So. And, we are. Uh, we, uh, we've been brought to you by UK National Radio. And hello to Nigel Crane and all the gang and, and uh, uh, all my wonderful friends over there. And the top 40 timelines heard on the weekends there Saturdays and across the UK. So, uh, Thanks and, for watching, uh, everybody. They love our sense of humor on the show. That's good. She that is all, we didn't have us. to get her off her phone first. Oh, look at this. Ooh, at she's this. chiming in now. She's yeah. catching on. This is uh, <laughs> this is Amanda for you folks out there. She's on our local station. She's also a, she produces the show over there while she looks at her phone. I don't know about producing, and, but uh, she definitely takes care of the video. Yeah, she on does. <laughs> God bless her. And but does, you can take over the producing. If she you does want. local <laughs> news and all kinds of stuff. There you go. You have a great week. And now I think we should all, um, after I do this, pose for the extra of the show, which is, um, uh, we have to come up with a new pose, of course, now. Everybody well, I, we should finish by s with our... Oh, yeah, you go ahead. Uniting... Let her do it, yeah. Uniting right. community worldwide. That's it. And now we can pose, folks. Get ready.